This video brought to you by Skillshare. Uploading. We'll try and take them by surprise. Let's see what this galaxy class starship can do. There is a theory that vessels commanded on the front lines are reflective of the era in which they were constructed. The advanced technologies, not to mention the skill and mentality of the officers, echoes the entirety of the organization and indeed the government that is being served. I have to say that I think, at least with the Galaxy class, this is absolutely true. The design of the Galaxy class was likely conceived through the middle or end of what has become known among the fans as the quote-unquote Federation Golden Era. The Golden Era is sometime just after the original series and into the first few seasons of the next generation. It's a time that is marked by the civilian perception of peace and prosperity. Most, if not all, Federation core worlds are a paradise. There is no want, no suffering, no crime, and scientific exploration is the key goal of Starfleet. At least, that's what everyone believes. In the background, we do know that there are some troubles, including Klingon raids as well as the Cardassian border wars. However, those are happening far away. And so, with this mentality, this perception, they designed the Galaxy-class starship. Well, they conceived it, they designed it, and deployed it early in the mid-2360s. The Galaxy Class was one of the few ships to be considered a top-tier vessel, with officers heavily competing to be on the billet. There were very few in production, less active, so these vessels were the peak of Federation technology. Their main purpose? Deep space exploration. The original development group was the Galaxy-class Starship Development Project that was located on Utopia Planitia. The construction was so massive that they created it both on the planet as well as in space, which I'm sure most everyone remembers, so we won't see a lot of complaints if, in an alternate universe, we see another iconic ship being constructed on a planet. One of the most unique, as well as major, aspects of the Galaxy class was the insistence of a civilian element. To be fair, it's not wholly unheard of to have civilians work alongside Starfleet. Certainly scientists did so quite a lot. However, this mentality turned the Galaxy class vessel into well, effectively an apartment in space, if not a small city in space. While most other ships would have families of the officers come with them, it appears that some Galaxy class had entire civilian populations. They had them there just to have them there. It would almost appear like a generational ship, except they didn't need to have such a vessel. And it really just put people in danger. As time moved on, the galaxy would lose a lot of prominence. The Borg and Dominion threat would force the creation of newer, more advanced vessels, and that kind of ship wasn't needed anymore. A vessel that's primary mission was science and exploration would have to take a back seat. This doesn't mean that it wouldn't still be in use. The USS Odyssey was destroyed attempting to save Commander Benjamin Sisko, and multiple Galaxy-class vessels would be seen during the Dominion War. The ship definitely could be modified into a strong command and control vessel, as well as a capital ship for the various fights. All of the systems could also be upgraded to give a bigger punch. Towards the end of the 2370s, the Galaxies would appear to become more workhorses than frontline vessels. They would, in a way, become the Mirandas of their generation. Now let me be clear, I do give a lot of guff to the Galaxy, but I think it's one of the best vessels in the fleet. It's the epitome of what Starfleet was ideally trying to be. It doesn't work in the Trek universe, but it is what Starfleet wants and thinks that they are. It's something that, like Picard, we should generally all aspire to be. Skillshare is an online learning tool that has had to have been required learning for any up-and-coming Starfleet engineers. One of the things I'm constantly asked is how to start a YouTube channel and make it successful in 2022. Skillshare is the honest-to-God answer. They have an extensive learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for all of those who love learning. You can literally go on Skillshare and find a class on how to research the topic you want to make a video on, then take a class on how to script it, look into what it takes to make your video successful as a story storyteller, and then even how to work with sponsors once you become the biggest thing on the internet. It is literally a one-stop shop to becoming the best Star Trek channel on YouTube, if not the world. Not only that, it gets a lot better. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description below will get a month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. In order to get this deal, I had to specifically go to Mount Doom and get rid of the one ring so that you could be successful.
Okay, maybe they just gave that because Skillshare is awesome, but it still sounds better if I had to do something for it. Trust me guys, I still take classes to this day and you should too. The best way to do that is through Skillshare. Click on the link below and become as smart as a Starfleet engineer, or as close as you can since we're not advanced humans. Analyzing the vessel from a technical standpoint, it comes with a saucer-shaped primary hull and a detachable secondary hull, which is also known as the star drive. There are two nacelles that are connected to the star drive itself. The ship could work as one entirety or be separated into two distinct vessels via saucer separation. The stated purpose of this was to allow families to escape with the primary hole as the star drive stayed to fight. They said that was the purpose, but we rarely ever observe that happening. The ship's layout is similar to that of other Starfleet designs that we've seen before. The main bridge is on deck one, and I have done extensive breakdowns on the bridges, like an unreasonable amount of time was spent on them, so you should go and check that out. I won't get too much into it, but it is worth noting that, unlike a few others, the Galaxy class will have a tactical or secondary bridge known as the Battle Bridge. A lot of people think that this is a CIC, it is not. But again, I discussed that in the other essays. There are differing variants of the bridge itself, but that's outside of this essay, as I've stated. Go check it out in the other ones. Connected to the bridge on the deck is the observation lounge, along with the captain's ready room. Another area that would definitively be on the saucer section is that of up to three sick bays, and they're located throughout the vessel. These bays would have the most advanced for the time at least, technology and be accessible to most everyone on the ship, though it may be the case that at least one of them was for Starfleet officers only. These areas would be connected to med labs, surgical suites, emergency biosupport, physical rehabilitation bays, and a morgue, because space is, is just, it's really a safe place. Engineering, like a lot of the Federation designs, would be absolutely massive and located on deck 36 on the Star Drive. It includes the before-mentioned warp core and was a wide open space for engineering officers. Speaking on the warp core itself, it was designed and tested at Outpost Saren T1 by the Theoretical Propulsion Group, which included Leah Brahms, who apparently was a much better individual when she's holographic than real. I guess Pornhub never really does leave, huh? We're now at warp 9.3, sir, which takes us past the red line. Continue accelerating. The ship had a theoretical warp of 9.8 with extreme risk. It could ultimately maintain warp 9.6 for several hours, as long as you were willing to fix it after you're done and had a cruising speed of warp 6.0. Because the ship is one of exploration, the scientific suites on the galaxy represent the best technology, probably in the alpha or beta quadrants. This includes, but isn't limited to, an extensive scientific department, stellar cartography, cybernetics lab, arboretum, cetacean labs where, yes, there were dolphins, and much more. Again, this would be the bulk of what most Galaxy-class ships were designed for, up until the Dominion War at least. I imagine these would then be changed to help with war efforts. The crew quarters, if we want to call them that, would be placed throughout the primary and secondary hull. While some quarters are more Spartan than others, it's basically luxury. And a lot of it is excessively luxurious. Whether it's the junior officer or all the way up to the captain, you were living a pretty good life. Honestly, this decadence is reflective of the entirety of the ship. The vessel, from stem to stern, is designed spaciously and comfortable. The color of the bulkheads, the carpeting, and lights are all made in an aesthetic that make one feel it's more like a love boat than an actual scientific or military vessel. It's literally the lap of decadence when it comes from an aesthetic perspective. Dispersed throughout the ship, but mainly located in the star drive, there are other vital areas that would be required for operations to occur. This includes the transporter rooms, which were mainly located on decks 6 and 14, as well as a few that are available in the cargo bay areas. There would also be the counselor's office, located on deck 9, arboretum, as I think I've discussed before, cargo bays that would have enough room for storage and anti-grav units, and again, transporter bays, as well as a bar known as 10 Ford that was... Wait for it. On deck 10, four of the ship that allowed a view outside of what was happening. Holodecks are located on deck 9, 10, and 11, a phaser range was on deck 12, and a gymnasium was there as well. There was also a salon relaxing area, replication center, which 
really never made any sense to me. They have replicators in their room, so anyway. We'd also have education facilities, including schools that taught children of all ages, as well as a theater and concert hall, because Picard. As I have said before, this is a city in space. It wasn't a base. People try to say that this was like a military base, but bases have actual security and ways to prevent incursion, and it's not really as decadent as we see here. This is a, this is more like a city with a local garrison that doesn't take war seriously. Just in case they ever wanted to leave their home away from home, the vessel would also have shuttle bays that generally appeared to utilize Time Lord technology, given how many things would fit in them versus the amount of space available. There were three different shuttle bays, with the main being on deck 5 and auxiliary smaller shuttle bays being on deck 13. The vessel would accommodate at least Type 6 and Type 7 shuttlecraft, along with the Dunabi class runabout and a Type 15 shuttle pod. There would also be a captain's yacht on the vessel, but that was in the shuttle bay that was for the captain. The vessel was extremely sophisticated for its time, utilizing isolinear-based computer systems. These were located in the computer cores, one of which would be accessed via a maintenance room in engineering. The isolinear technology allowed for faster processing times than the duotronics available in older craft. Ultimately, there were three computer cores though, with two in the saucer section and one in engineering, as I've noted, which was in the star drive. While I do give the vessel a hard time, it was not without its ability to defend itself. It was definitively a glass cannon. That is beyond argument. Once the shielding fell, the ship was generally destroyed. It does appear the designers were aware of this weakness though and enhanced the shields of the Galaxy class far better than any peer that existed in the Alpha or Beta quadrants. This meant that a Galaxy could take a beating before being destroyed. And its defensive systems were pretty stout. It had 12 phaser banks with phaser arrays placed throughout the primary hull and star's drive. It would also include fore and aft torpedo launchers on the secondary hull. The vessel had at least a complement of 250 photon torpedoes and was capable of distributing antimatter mines, because mining a territory is definitely something the good guys do. Updated Dominion War variants would include at least two more phaser arrays on the nacelles, which can be seen on the USS Venture. The systems of the original Galaxy class would be upgraded around 2370 to allow for higher yield torpedoes and to enhance the targeting systems. They'd also have stronger phasers, but that's not talked about as much. The Behemoth would generally only crew roughly a thousand officers with 200 supporting personnel, or families. It could accommodate up to 15,000. 15,000. Now to be fair, that was standing room only, that's when you're evacuating people, but you would think they'd do at least half that. It is 642 meters long, or 2,106 feet, which is roughly half of a mile. The width of the vessel was 463 meters, or 1,519 feet. Taking that into miles, it's about a fifth of a mile. And its height was 195 meters, or 639 feet, which is a tenth of a mile. So if you ran the length of it, then you ran the width of it, and then you ran from the bottom to the top, you would have almost ran a complete mile, which is a pretty large vessel. Galaxy classes with a name that we were aware of include the USS Challenger, Enterprise D, Galaxy, Odyssey, Venture, and Yamato. Though there were, as I stated, several unnamed as well. As I've discussed, the Galaxy class is possibly one of the most well-known ships. Arguably, it's becoming one of the most iconic ships from the 90s and even into now. Its design and technology was held back by a Starfleet that forgot how to conduct war, but it was an, still an extremely fun class, at least in my opinion. What are yours? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next. More Reloaded.